Hey guys, welcome to part one or part two, depending on how you want to count them, of my 386SX demo machine build. I just received the mainboard for the computer, of course without a manual or anything like that. Um, I tried to identify the board and find resources online, but that turned out impossible basically. But that doesn't stop me. <music> Okay, um, since I don't have the manual for this mainboard now, I think I'm going to try to figure out what all the jumpers and connectors that are not labeled are for. And some of them are labeled, but I'm not really sure if they enable or disable the function that they describe. So I'm not sure if I should open or close the jumpers. And that's why I'm going to try to reverse engineer that now. I printed the pinouts for the CPU and for the chipset and hope that that will be enough to figure out what's going on. So yeah, let's start. Um, let's start with power good. I think, mm, yeah, let's see. <laughs> Oops. I'm basically just using my multimeter to trace where things are going and then use common sense and um, the data sheets of the chips to figure out what's actually going on. So it looks like um, here's also some damage on the board where the battery was. So I think this trace might actually have been eaten away by the asset. Okay, so the positive terminal of the battery goes to this diode. This is the pin configuration. So it has to be the sixth pin on this side. This section here, I think I'll draw a schematic for it to figure out how it works because I'm not really understanding what's going on. Okay, here's what I found out so far. Um, I checked the power good jumper, which is apparently used to switch between the um, power good signal that's generated from the AT power supply. Um, or it can alternatively use this voltage comparator to check if the power supply is stable and um, the voltage is not too low to drive the rest of the board. So that's what this jumper does. This. Here seems to be the connector for um, the CMOS battery, which this all here mostly appears to be um, A for switching between the built-in and the external CMOS battery and to prevent accidental charging of these because these often are not rechargeable while these are. So all these run to this pin header here and apparently the bottom one is used to reset the CMOS, so the BIOS settings, while the jumper has to be in the top position to um, retain the data. It, so um, let's see. This pin goes right to the um, battery pin for on, the, um, on this chip, which contains the real-time clock and the CMOS RAM. And this is the um, voltage that is coming from either the batteries or it seems to be also possible to directly use five volts from AT with the rest of the um, components used to switch between battery and, um, and the AT power. Yeah, I think that's the first interesting thing I found out. And I think with that, we're done with the bottom half 
of the board. I think I understand all the jumpers and uh, connectors. So let's continue with the next one. So down here we have a few more. So one is called pipeline. Then we have one that is speaker, which is obvious, I think. Reset should be obvious too. One called parity. Um, one called LED, whichever kind of LED that's supposed to drive, um, possibly power, I would assume, or maybe a turbo, I'm not sure, we will see. And there's one that's just labeled uh, JP2, no idea what that means, and it's a two-way configuration. One that's labeled turbo, I think it's obvious, but we'll anyway see if it has to be open or closed to get turbo functionality. Um, and another one called JP3, which has no further explanation, and one called Display. Yeah, let's see what those mean. So the um, pipeline jumper here, this one, connects to this pin here of the 386, which is called next address. And setting this, uh, this, this to, let's check, setting, connecting this to ground will make the uh, 386 use pipeline memory mode, which in theory is a bit faster because um, the memory cycle will start earlier while the previous one is not finished yet. So if we close this jumper, the CPU should run uh, slightly faster memory accesses. And you can also see this pin is connected via this uh, resistor array to 5 volts. So if we don't set the jumper, that means um, that means we get slower memory accesses. Okay, reset. Let's continue with reset. No, let, let's skip reset. I think this one is pretty obvious. Parity. Let's check the parity bit on the parity um, connector. So I think one of the um, memory chips of the chipset can enable or disable parity checking of the memory. Um, so in, in theory, it's safe to just leave it disabled. But if we have um, parity memory, which I actually have, then the chipset can do parity checks and make sure that the memory content has not been um, become invalid by whatever reason. So let's see which of those two chips had or can enable the parity check. That's my multimeter. Silent. Okay, I found out a bit more. The parity jumper is used to either forward or not forward the parity check signal that this chip generates. So this chip always checks the parity of the RAM accesses and then basically connects it right here to this pin. And the other pin connects to the parity check input uh, or the parity error input pin on this chip which is then used to create a non-maskable interrupt in the case of, an, uh, of a parity error, which is then sent back to the CPU to indicate that there was a memory problem. So this chip checks parity. Here we can either decide to forward or not. This chip uh, evaluates it and creates a memory uh, a m interrupt for the CPU if there is something wrong. And in case we don't set the uh, jumper here, then it is on a pull up to 5 volts, which means it's basically always indicating there is no parity error. So, um, putting the jumper there will enable parity checks. So, the Figuring out the turbo switch was relatively easy this time. This pin is just connected to ground, and this one goes first of all to the um, input of this inverter chip. So this is an, an inverter, 
And whatever signal goes in in this pin comes out inverted on this pin. There's also this resistor array here, which acts as a pull up against five volts. So when there's nothing here, when it when this pin is not or this this switch is not closed, then we get a positive output on this pin, which connects then to the turbo pin on this chip. Whenever um, this pin goes high, the CPU will run at the um, same clock speed as the um, as the clock provided. So when we put something there or close the switch there, then the CPU runs faster. <laughs> Display uh, jumper here basically just goes right into one of the I/O pins of this chip, and this is a freely programmable microcontroller. So, without knowing what the firmware on this chip actually does, there is no way to figure out what it really does. I assume it's it may be used to switch between uh, monochrome and VGA or EGA um, graphics. Um, I guess we can just figure it out once the once we assemble the machine, so that it, it that that the, on on boot up the system knows if it's supposed to use a VGA card or not, or VGA EGA or something older which uses a different memory address for the um, frame buffer or the the console output. That's what I think this one does, but I have no confirmation of that because, as I said, it goes directly into um, this pin right here. And that way we can never figure out what it actually does. Um, the LED connector I figured out actually goes into this transistor and then through this um, resistor back into the turbo um, connector. So what it actually does is it uh, enables or disables the output when the tur when turbo mode is on or off. So we can use that for hooking up the turbo LED on the machine. The next I checked are these five here. Um, apparently this one is directly connected to one of the input pins of this microcontroller. This one seems to be directly connected to, um, to a resistor and then to 5 volts and those two and this one are ground. So that's why I assume that these three are used for the power LED so that you could put a two or three um, pin uh, connector there. And because they're often used together, I assume that this one, these two are used for the keyboard lock, which um, the case I'm going to use doesn't have. So this one is going to the pin and through a pull up and this one connects to ground. So we can enable or disable keyboard lock here, I assume. Um, I have no, no idea if that's true, but uh, uh, it's very likely, I think. Yeah, so I think this one these three, these three pins, they can switch between hardware and software controlled turbo mode. Um, there are also um, H and S symbols uh, printed there, so I assume that means hard and software. Anyway, um, if we set the jumper in this position, then the pin that, that controls the turbo mode, um, as described earlier, will directly connect to this one, to this pin. But if we set it in this position, then it will be controlled by the, um, by the um, microcontroller. So that means um, we can set it to either hardware or software controlled turbo mode. Um, what's left are these three, which are also connected to the, um, to the turbo thing. <laughs> uh, I have not figured them out completely, but I think those may be two additional LED or, or control signals for switching one of those fancy um, um, megahertz displays that some computer cases had back in the day. Yeah, I think anyway that in turbo mode the, um, one of these two, two will turn on and in non-turbo mode the other one. Um, I will 
confirm that once we have plugged this in. I'm pretty sure this is an output signal. So I think I will just measure what's going on there once the board is working. So this was part one of reverse engineering the mainboard connectors. There are a few left, but I think I can only confirm their use once I turn on the machine. But for that, I first have to repair the battery damage. That's what I'll do next time. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like, share and subscribe. Until next time, bye.